Great, good evening, good afternoon, I mean. <laughs> I'd just like to start by asking all of you to think about these big moments in business history. Netflix redefines the way people rent movies. Blockbuster is out of business. Uber delivers fatal blows to taxicab industries all over the world, even convincing regulators that Uber is not a transportation company, it is a tech firm. Um, now we have Airbnb taking on the hotel industry. Hotel reservations decline and the verdict is still out. Arguably, one could say that each of these businesses were either a victim or a victor of an inflection point in their industries. And as CEOs, we all encounter these inflection points. Those are those defining moments where everything changes, something that forces your company, your organization to change. It could be a regulatory change that forces you to change the way you operate strategically and operationally. It could be shifting consumer preferences or economic shifts, but change is inevitable. Today's panel of CEOs, and I'm so glad I spent some time with them at lunch, very, very insightful and interesting. Um, they have all navigated waves of inflection points in their business journeys. Alan Kohlberg, I'm going to start with Alan. He's been on the cutting edge um, responding to seismic changes in competition in the insurance industry. Um, then we have Todd Peterson and, and Adam Warby, and they are successfully leading in the ever-changing tech industry where we know being disrupted or disrupting is just a way of life in your industry. And so I'm, in a short time we have, I'll start with asking you one or two questions, but then we'll turn it to the audience and close out. So I'd like to start with you, Alan. Intel's uh, Andrew Grove, in writing about strategic inflection points, titled his book, Only the Paranoid Survive. What potential game-changing inflections, what, which, what's keeping you up at night, and how are you preparing for these inflection points? So, Rosa, I appreciate the question. When you started it with Intel, I was thinking about today's news from Intel, but fortunately she didn't go there. It's a different topic for me. Yeah, right. um, you know, the things that we're focused on is assurance. What we do is we partner with the world's leading companies as they sell devices, products to consumers. And so, really, a couple things are changing in that world. Where consumers buy products, so think of a car or a house or a cell phone, you know, that's been changing uh, over the last decade with digital. But if you think to the future, it's going to change far more rapidly. So for example, Ford is heavily working on a connected car. And if you look at where that's going to go, Ford will become the wireless carrier, right? Wow. They'll be able to be an MVNO. They'll sell you the cell phone. Uh, 5G will put uh, Amazon into the mobile business. So one thing we spend a lot of time thinking about is where are consumers likely to buy things in the future? And how do we make sure we're there, wherever the consumer wants to go buy things? You know, the second major change that we're focused on, and you mentioned three great examples, Rosa, mm -hmm. is changing ownership models. So in the old day, consumers bought everything. That is fundamentally changing. And you can see it, for example, with autonomous vehicles, gradually we'll have shifting of some ownership of cars from individuals to corporations. And so we have to be able to follow that shifting ownership. You know, um, and it's literally every category. You go to China today, there's a sharing economy on umbrellas. I mean, so you just have to really think about ownership and how those are going to evolve. And then the final trend we're very focused on, Todd, you're going to talk about it, is connectivity. Uh, and as we think about the future, how do we support the companies that are doing connected home or the connected car? Because the reality is everything's going to be connected. That's going to fundamentally change the products and services. And so we're trying to remain relevant to our large partners as they change their business. But Rosa, that's what I lose sleep about and also excited about. They're all great opportunities as well. You're losing sleep and you're excited at the Equally. same time. That's, that's what's driving business. Todd, um, you founded a company that was named one of the 50 most innovative companies in the world. Now, you made the jump from startup to being acquired um, by, for $2 billion. 
And, um, but there are many examples of other startups who launched and established companies who launch innovative products and they fail. Um, for example, Google Glass. Um, you know, Google Glass proactively responded to what it thought was an inflection point in wearable technology. And within 18 months, it was doomed a, a colossal failure. So um, it, apparently, maybe it leaped before it looked. I don't know. But um, you, clearly, you clearly got it right. What is your formula for, for seeing these inflection points? How did you know that the market forces would move from smartphones to smart homes? Right. And now we're seeing three, I mean, massive, massive growth. growth. Ma massive growth. Well, the, the one thing I would say is um, we don't get everything right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, maybe, and this might be um, a positive for us. We don't have the capital Google has to make massive bets on something that to me looked quite obvious. And when I say quite obvious, um, I never and most of you would never walk around wearing Google glasses because it, you look dorky. Um, and that's, <laughs> you know, like it or not, we have a little bit of personal pride. And so, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit common sense based when mm -hmm. it comes to making decisions on what things to invest in, what projects to work on, whether it is building new hardware technologies or new services platforms. Um, so we're a little bit more um, ca cautious in testing up front to see mm -hmm. if, if it really is going to work before we make major investments. Um, what I would say is you know, my, my company has um, evolved dramatically over the last you know, 12 years. Um, Part of that is, um, you know, as a CEO, as a founder of a company, or even working inside of a company, it's, it's understanding the capabilities of, of, you know, what you do and the team you have, mm -hmm. um, the market you're serving, we happen to be consumer facing. And, um, you know, I try not to get to a point where market conditions force me to innovate. Um, not that that won't ever happen, it hasn't really yet. Um, I pay, we pay attention to the, the you know, competitive landscape in, in a very big way. but. Um, uh, I think that my team does a great job at looking at what we want to become and how we want to deliver mm -hmm. to the consumers. And, and a lot of it is around um, this belief in everything, be, and, and not belief, it's, it's happening. Yeah. Everything is going to be connected. Um, in our customers' homes, on average, there are 15 connected devices and growing, which is a great um, yeah. problem, but a big problem. Um, you know, it's wirelessly connected, there's Wi Fi issues, there are you know, hardware issues, the, the Internet of Things is quite different than um, an app. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually things. Things break, things disconnect, and so you have to have the capabilities to provide service or, you know, um, technical support on a, on a real-time, 24-7 um, basis. So um, I think my, my company, my team has done a good job at looking kind of towards the future, and um, we have um, quite a few initiatives going on, and we're constantly testing and measuring those. And the ones that ha have you know good consumer reaction, and we think are viable products or services, we roll out. And, but we actually you know are quite cautious in the even in the testing of that. And when it works, figure out how to duplicate it and then and then scale it. But is there a formula to this foresight? Because it sounds like a um, combination of faith and foresight. And a lot of companies say we test. We, but you must be you must have your finger on the pulse of something that well I would say I would I don't know that it's necessarily a formula mm -hmm. um, but it's it's a conversation mm -hmm. um, you know I have my um, executive staff meetings every Monday um, we have a cadence around uh, you know, we call it our um, top top hundred meeting which are people from all departments inside of the company everyone um, the, the top leaders thinking about concepts and ideas that consumers bring to us um, mm -hmm. that employees have around changes that we should make, how we should deliver different services, integrations or technologies that we should build or, or buy. Um, and so I wouldn't call our form, it's more of a cadence. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, and this is probably true for both of you also, it's not necessarily what you're gonna do, it's what you're not going to do. Yes. That's honestly the, the biggest challenge we have focus. in our company is focus. We have yes. tremendous amounts of uh, opportunities inside them. It's a huge, uh, it, it's kind of the last, for me, the last frontier with the consumer, um, we have smartphone, that became obvious, but homes haven't gotten truly smart yet. Um, and we are, we're, we're just in the beginning stages of what we're going to be delivering to the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, we have potential partnerships you know, with, with Alan's company um, coming up in the future that we've discussed and contemplated. Um, with um, 
uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Airbnb. Mm -hmm. I mean, our our, pro our product and platform is perfect for them and, and other um, you know applications. So we it's it's a matter of what to do and what we can do in a great way, deliver great you know enjoyable services to consumers that makes their lives easier. But we're we're constantly pushing things out off the the, the project list. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, Adam, let me move to you. you yeah. The brick and mortar retail sector is clearly at an inflection point, or one would say a series of inflection points with the rise of online shopping. Now we can click on Amazon and we can get everything from books to broccoli. And um, your partner uh, and, and your company, Microsoft, uh, you got together and you sponsored research on how retailers, brick and mortar retailers, should reinvent themselves. Um, now, I understand the study was very interesting. What should CEOs here take away from that study that you and Microsoft put together? Yeah, so just to quickly explain who Avanade is. Uh, we're a joint venture between Microsoft and Accenture, a global digital and cloud consulting business, uh, about 30,000 professionals around the world now. Uh, started up in 2000, so it's been a you know, in, in the context of this conversation, I think we're both trying to transform ourselves and help customers transform themselves as well. And retail is one of our big sectors. The study was pretty interesting. Um, uh, no surprise, I'm sure, to this audience that over two thirds of the thousand or so CXO we, we studied said, you know, the store is going to be dramatically different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, whether it's a specialty store or a seasonal store, Fulfillment, that's over 50% of the people studied say fulfillment. You know, you buy something online, you pick it up at the store. So it, it changes dramatically from the, the traditional view of things. The, the Perhaps the less surprise, uh, less obvious thing is the role of people in the store. And particularly with the millennial generation being the majority workforce, how do you get them ready for that? So the, the key message actually for, for me, and, and it's not just retail, is actually this whole thing about the employee experience uh, affecting and being fundamental to customer experience is the, the root of success, really. Mm -hmm. So in the case of retail, you can use technology to train people via video. You know, you, you have to get them ready if it's a, a seasonal store, as I say. Uh, but that connection between employee experience and customer experience is what we spend a lot of our time doing, whatever the industry is. Uh, I'd say you all have to be very good listeners, like what you're saying. You, you integrate the information, you're listening, and have a good notion about what the market wants, what people want, and focusing on experience. So now I'm going to go to the audience. This is an excellent panel, everything you wanted to know about navigating inflection points, preparing for change from people who've taken the jump? Any questions? Can you just state your name and your company, please, and stand? Hello. Uh, Building on what you were just talking about, Adam, with the retail study, did you look at all at what Walmart has done with marketplaces and Jet and, and Flipkart recently? Uh, not, not specifically at that, uh, at that trend. I mean, the, the, the big thing we did talk about was AI, uh, because you know, that's an obvious thing around you know, what would be the impact of AI on the buying experience. Uh, and again, I think one of the big themes that came out there is over two thirds in this case of the, the people in the study felt and viewed that technology could help the emotional connection of their customers to the products and services they were selling. And I think it's one of the, again, not the intuitive thing, that there's this fear, I think, in a lot of us that technology is taking the world over. We've talked about it today. Mm -hmm. And you know, the robots and machines sound sort of unemotional. Uh, and it, you know, yet people, you know, this combination of humans and machines, I think, is the theme that's really, I think, coming through very strongly. Uh, and the, the, I, I say sometimes, you know, we focus on programming the technology. We've also got to program our people uh, to work with machines and, and think about what does it take to have an emotional connection, improve that emotional connection between customers and our products and service using technology. Don't let the technology take over. Yeah, Rosa, maybe I can add mm -hmm. one thought, uh, not specifically on Walmart and what they're doing, but broadly what companies should be doing, yes. or at least how we try to think about it. 
which is you gotta be really careful that you don't define yourself by your current product. So if I was to say I was an insurance company, that is a long-term probably losing business to be in because the mm -hmm. world is changing so fast. So we really tried hard to think about what do we really do? And I would encourage every company to think about that. What we really do is we partner with the world's leading companies to give them better economics from every consumer transaction. And we smooth out the cash flow risk for the average consumer who can't afford a big payment. And so if you think about your world that way, mm -hmm. you have completely different set of businesses. But if I said I'm doing auto insurance, you know, that's a scary that's, world. That's interesting you say that. Um, that we think about our company exactly the same way, exactly. which is um, the, the way people view what we're doing, which is smart home uh, yeah. a services platform inside of the home. It's not just controlling lights and thermostat. That's, that is one thing we do, but it's not what we're going to be doing. Um, exactly. And to disruption, um, just I was thinking about it while, while everyone was talking. We are constantly trying to disrupt ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not to do it, it's because um, thinking about cons the consumer first or your customer first, whether it be enterprise or consumer or whatever, um, it always comes down to what do they need and how will they like it delivered to them, mm -hmm. in what form or fashion, and at what price point works for them in, in a, in a long-term sustainable way. And so um, it, it's, it's interesting you say that, even you know, in a consumer-facing yeah. business like ours, um, we, we hope to not look anything like we look now in five years. So you're disrupting yourselves yeah. before disrupting others. Yeah, I okay. guess that's going to anyway. happen anyway. That used to yeah, be so a pejorative yeah. thing, but now it's a, it's a good thing yeah. in business. Are there, is there another bold person with a question? Okay. Hi, my name is Victoria Socia, and uh, I have a quick question on, from the panel on your approach to blockchain technology and potential implications on what you're doing and if you're looking on implementing that technology in your fields. Adam, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, the uh, I, I put it in early incubation for us. I mean, Microsoft has a blockchain uh, service on, on it, Azure. Uh, the, we've done uh, two sort of good pilots so far, one in financial services and one in, in the logistics world. Um, you know, I think it is really early for blockchain. Uh, there are still a lot of questions uh, around uh, scalability and, and how it's going to get applied. Um, you know, the applications. I, I, the general point here is that um, it's the same with AI and you know, smart mm -hmm. advisors, robotics. You have to start and start with the idea of what are you applying this technology to. I'm an engineer by background. I'm most in, in, interested in the application of technology. So blockchain in, in its own right and you know, the, a trusted distributed network is interesting technology, but you've got to get the unique application. Um, and obviously cryptocurrencies is the big thing of the day. We'll see where that all lands up. So I'd say still very early days. Yeah, let me add to what Adam said. I agree completely with the idea. You have to have a specific use case, uh, but uh, we're, we've found one so far. So we do some life insurance. Uh, and it's a horrible experience for the consumer because your you know, loved one has just died. You have to get all this paperwork together. You have to go through this horrible claim process. It takes forever. With blockchain, we can pay the claim the second the death certificate shows up in a public records database. We don't have to get anything from the consumer. But you have to find that specific use case. Otherwise, you can waste a lot of time and effort. Yeah, and I, for us, early stage, and we're this, we see, think the same way, and people ask all the time. Um, uh, it's got to be applicable to something that we're delivering as a service, and right. as of yet, not in, in my business. So, Well, one thing I'll say that I've noticed about all of these pioneers who are just mastering these inflection points and, um, and mastering change is that there's uh, a quality about challenging conventional wisdom. And I can say that about my own business. I launched my business, the Whitaker Group, 15 years ago when conventional wisdom said that um, uh, it had convinced many global investors that Africa was a mendicant continent, mm. really just a place for foreign aid-driven economies. And I was among those who challenged that orthodoxy, and I created a company whose sole purpose is to drive investment into Africa and build projects. And we've been doing that, and now instead of just advising investors, we are also investing. And today, Africa is delivering some of the highest returns on investment 
and African businesses and consumers are spending $5.6 trillion. And this was just something that would have been unheard of uh, decades ago. And, and so, you know, we've taken that jump and we've convinced, we've challenged that orthodoxy. So I just want, in just the few seconds we have left, I want to ask you the last question. In one sentence, what do you see as the next big uh, thing in your industry? Well, uh, I mean, for us, it is artificial intelligence um, in, in smart home, without question. And, and delivering services through, and, and in, it's, that's data driven, but it's correct data, not, not just mass amounts of data. Uh, I'd probably say uh, disintermediation of insurance. You already see it in reinsurance with alternative capital. I think you're going to have crowdfunding as a legitimate insurance alternative at some point. I'm with Todd, really. It's all about the data. I mean, the AI is only interesting. It's only as good as the data you reason over. And, uh, you know, too many of the AI projects are about sort of robotics and things like that. If you want real learning, you've got to have great data. And uh, we, we're working with one customer at the moment who's, uh, you know, been a product provider of, of uh, to the food and uh, beverage industry in, in uh, products that basically, uh, they're hygiene products. And they flip their whole model around to provide a service by understanding instead of just turning up with a pallet of chlorine or whatever to clean things, they know when, based on the pattern of usage of their products, to replenish. Simple idea, but flipping from products to services based on data. Well, I wish we had more time, but I, I want to thank the panelists and thank the audience. I think this has been uh, quite of an insightful discussion, and I just want to leave you with a thought. As you call your Uber to take you back to your Airbnb rental, where you <laughs> click on Netflix to watch your favorite series, remember that each of these concepts, now multi-billion dollar businesses, are the result of forward-thinking innovators who foresaw opportunities and they took the jump, like you all. Thank you so much, and thank, thank all you. of you. Thank you, Rosa.